Okay, here we go. Lecture six, avoiding past fallacies. This is also the homework one lecture tutorial for Econ 201. So there's three categories of cost fallacies or cost considerations I want to go over here. And what I'm going to do is going to give you just a very brief definition, concept, walkthrough. And then we'll look at a scenario where we apply the concept. And then we'll do an additional scenario which will be structured like the homework. So that's a practice problem basically that we'll work through together in the video. And then you'll be equipped to go and look at the homework and work through that problem on your own. They will be uh, structured in pretty much exactly the same manner. Okay, so let's start with the fallacy of sunk cost. A sunk cost is a cost that has already been incurred and cannot be recovered. So think about a sunk cost as something that is over and done with. You cannot go back. You cannot get your money back if it was a monetary outlay. You cannot get your time back if it was something you spent time towards. Okay. Now, technically speaking, sunk costs are not even costs at all. Most people refer to them as costs. It's kind of car common parlance, but in econ jargon, this would be uh, referred to as an outlay. Costs are prospective, forward-looking. Right, so costs are only relevant when I'm looking forward and saying, should I choose action A or action B? And I know that if I choose A going forward, I won't get to do B. So B is the opportunity cost of A, and A is the opportunity cost of B. Stuff I've, that's already happened. Now, if I had to spend money to do A, let's say A costs $50, and I choose it, and I spend the $50, and then I can't get my money back. Now, sometimes I get my money back, right? I could return an item or I could get a uh, refund. Let's say I can't get a refund on A. So I've spent the $50. $50 is no longer a cost, technically speaking. It's an it's an outlay. I've spent the $50 and it's, it's not coming back. So opportunity costs don't apply retrospectively to things that are already done in, pa in the past that we're looking back on. Now, let's think about an example of sunk cost. This one's near and dear to me because, as I think I've mentioned before, one of my big hobbies is uh, fixing up old cars. So this is an actual uh, car that I've been working on for a couple years. It's a 67 Chevelle. It actually belongs to my wife, but I've been uh, fixing it up for her. Now, th I've tweaked the numbers a little bit here, but uh, more or less true story that I've en encountered several times. I purchase a vintage car for just let's say let's just say twenty five hundred dollars, and then I put forty five hundred dollars into repairs and parts. So I probably rebuild the brakes, put new tires on it, um, probably have to replace some panels, uh, do maybe do some maintenance and uh, repairs on the engine, reupholster it, so on and so forth. So I've spent a total of seven thousand dollars on this car, fixing it up, making it nice, making it drivable. I go on, I do some market research, I go to Kelly Blue Book, or there's a few other uh, used car guides on the internet that, that have very accurate uh, price estimates. And it tells me that the value of the car in its current state that of repair, so after I fixed it, is $5,500. Now, if I want to sell the car, am I going to hold out for $7,000 because that's the amount of money I put into it and I've got to get that money back? A lot of people fall for this. Now, I realized that no, the market value is $5,500 and that's the best I could hope to get. And a lot of times I have to settle for less than that because I don't have the time it would take me to find a buyer who's willing to pay that value. So I might settle for $5,000 or $4,500. I will realize that all the money I spent on fixing up this car is sunk. I can't get it back and it shouldn't influence my decision going forward. If I suddenly need $5,000 to... Um, pay for important bills. You know, let's say one of my kids goes into the hospital, God forbid, and I need $5,000 to pay a hospital bill. Uh, I'm, if I need to, I'll sell the car to get the five grand, right, to, to accomplish something that's more pressing at the time. I'm not going to say, nope, nope, not selling the car unless I get 7000 because by God, that's what I put into it. Don't get hung up on the sunk costs. Now, let me add one more wrinkle here. What is the opportunity cost for me to hold on to the car? If I want to keep using and driving this car, What's the opportunity cost? Well, if I could have sold it for 5,500 bucks, I have to realize that's the cost of me keeping the car because I could sell it for 5,500 bucks and put that money in the bank, invest that money in the stock market, or use that money for any other pursuits. Okay? So it's costing me $5,500 to hold the car plus then the operating costs, you know, insurance, gas, oil, maintenance, etc. It's another thing a lot of people don't often consider when they're thinking about you know, when, they, when they collect things. 
there's an opportunity cost to every asset in your possession. Okay, now let's uh, work through a practice situation. You paid $80 for a ticket to a fish concert. During the concert, the smell of fellow attendees marijuana smoke begins making you queasy to the point where you feel like you might not be able to hold in the contents of your stomach. <laughs> now, are you going to stick it out because otherwise you'd be wasting the $80? Or are you going to leave, go home, and rest, make the best of a bad situation? I think a lot of people would feel that, well, I better stay because that's $80 is a lot of money and I want to get my money's worth. But you're not going to get your money's worth. The, the money's worth is gone. It's over and gone. It's water under the bridge. If the, if the reefer smoke is making you sick, you should probably go home because you don't want to barf all over yourself at the concert and then stagger home. That would be even worse. So the best situation is to leave, go home, rest, feel better, cut your losses. Okay, let's move on and talk about another one that I think is insufficiently appreciated, especially by those who have not been initiated into the higher orders of economics. Welcome to the club number 908. You have joined the sacred order of the stonecutters, who since ancient times have split the rocks of ignorance that obscure the light of knowledge and truth. Now let's all get drunk and play ping pong. And that is the opportunity cost of your time. Every minute you occupy with one activity is a minute you can't use for any other activity. And remember, I've, as I've stated in previous lectures, time in many ways is kind of the ultimate resource. No activity is free. Even if there's no monetary uh, expense or a, an outlay of other resources, there is always an opportunity cost of time. And if you lock up a certain amount of time doing one thing, that's time you can no, no longer use for other activities. Let me give you a common recurring example. My neighbors, we'll call them John and Jane, are very nice people. In fact, very nice, very friendly, and very helpful. I, I really love them to death, but they're really chatty. And there's a good chance that if I run into John or Jane while I'm walking around out back, um, I'll, I'll wind up go, going into a 30-minute conversation. And if I'm busy, and I usually am, I have, uh, I have a couple side businesses I run, I have a, a volunteer commitment at a local school, and I'm always working on projects, and I'm always doing stuff with my kids, so I'm a pretty busy guy. So I don't want to necessarily have a 30-minute conversation with John or Jane on any given day. So I try to avoid them, because it's a time suck, right? I'll say that's 30 minutes that I'll never get back. So I'm very cognizant of the opportunity cost of my time and uh, wary of getting into commitments that might waste that precious resource. Okay, now let's work through a practice problem. Remember, opportunity costs are only uh, relevant in a prospective fashion, so we want to think about what we will do going forward. Here's a scenario that uh, may be uh, relevant for you guys. It's 10 p.m. on a Saturday night. You have a five-page essay due for English on Monday and you haven't even started yet. Your friends are begging you to come out to a party with them, but you know that you will not that will not only eat up what's left of your Saturday night, but come on, we all know this, that's going to burn up half of your Sunday as well cuz you're going to be out until 3 or 4 a.m., then you're going to be sleeping in till probably 2 p.m. If my experience is any guide. Right? And you, let's say you were planning on using Sunday to take care of your chores, maybe watch a movie, maybe call your mom, and then you know maybe need some time to finish up that English essay. So what should you do? Push off the homework and party all night? Come on, you only live once. You'll never have this kind of chance again. Or should you politely decline, realize that partying now will ruin your Sunday and likely result in a bad grade on the assignment because you're going to confine yourself to writing this whole assignment in a one or two hour block right before midnight on Sunday night. Now, there is no right or wrong answer here, but in a homework question like this, I'll say, tell me what your choice and explain. And then if you have a coherent explanation that properly applies the concept of opportunity cost, you will get full credit. Okay, and last item that I want to consider is the idea of the opportunity cost of owner's labor. I, as I've mentioned, have a couple small side businesses that I operate, and I've done those for, for many years in certain cases. And I've also known a lot of uh, independent small businessmen and women, people who run their own businesses. And one thing I found is 
pretty common shortcoming amongst uh, entrepreneurs and, and small scale enterprises is that they often pay insufficient attention to the value of their own time and their own labor inputs. Right. So here's the idea. The owner of a business must account for the value of his or her own labor when assessing the profitability of that business. And oftentimes there's a tremendous amount of labor put in from the owner. In, in a small business, the owner is usually the hardest working person there. So here's an example. At the end of the harvest season, Farmer Joe sells his entire crop for cash, a haul of let's say $120,000. Now, Joe has kept a careful record of his outlays, his expenses, uh, during the year. He's got fuel for his tractors, depreciation and maintenance on his tractors, parts, equipment and supplies, interest payments, maybe he has an operating loan, which is pretty common amongst farmers, and so on. Okay, And let's say these add up to $70,000. So, just a very rough and ready calculation of his profits. You might be saying, well, he earned 120, his expenses were 70, so his profit is $50,000, right? Is that it? that done well for a lot of people yeah joe will say yeah i earned fifty thousand dollars farming last year and that's not incorrect but we want to think about what was the opportunity cost of the labor joe does not write paychecks to himself and that's also very common for small business owners he is therefore not accounting for the cost of his own labor input now let's just assume for the sake of easy math that joe puts two thousand hours in over the entire farming season and let's also say that Joe knows that there are, there's a job opportunity he could have in town where he would earn $25 an hour. Joe's implicit labor cost has to be reckoned in the following manner. It's the $25 an hour he could have been earning times the 2,000 hours that he put in, right? And that's basically a full-time job. 50 weeks times 40 hours a week is 2,000 hours. So Joe could have earned 50 grand if he had a job in town. So here's what we want to say. Joe's cash flow on his business is $50,000. He does earn $50,000, but his actual profit is zero because if he paid himself what he's worth and he knows or he ought to know that he's worth $25 an hour. Why? Because he could go and get a job for $25 an hour. His actual profit is then zero because to the $70,000 for fuel and equipment and parts we have to add the fifty thousand dollars implied cost of joe's own labor you can't ignore the opportunity cost of your own labor when you're running a business or well you can but you shouldn't if you want to uh, really know what your profit is and really know how successful you are and how efficient you are okay let's do a practice problem on that let's say you own a, a hair salon or a barber shop you put in 40 hours a week managing the business and styling or cutting hair. Now, you keep very careful track of all your income. That's pretty easy because you usually charge you know, a certain rate per customer. And then your expenses. And here's maybe a non-comprehensive list of, of the expense items. Rent, on the, rent and utilities and maintenance on the building. Let's say you have a couple of employees. You have to pay them wages, and maybe benefits. Right, then you know there's a lot of miscellaneous stuff, but let's just say that we're encompassing all of the relevant expenses. Okay, and you don't write yourself a paycheck, which again is pretty common for small business owners. They simply take what we call the residual, the amount left over from all the income that came in after all the expenses for a certain time period were paid. And let's say you just put that in your personal bank account every week. All right, so here's the figures. Total income average is 2,500 a week total expenses average 1900 a week and let's say the total expenses average 1900 dollars a week what is your imputed average hourly wage so if you're not paying yourself you're just take, claiming this residual here's how we want to calculate this so it would be the total the income here minus the expenses here so that of course is going to work out to 600 dollars per week and then we want to divide in the amount of hours so it's a 600 per week divided by 40 hours 600 by 40 that's going to be $15 an hour so that's the imputed average hourly wage $15 an hour if you could sell the business and work for someone else at $40 an hour would you all right now again there's no right or wrong answer here because you might say well I really really love the idea of owning my own business and I really involve I really love the business I'm in running a hair salon 
Okay, then that's fine. And I can't tell you that's wrong, right? I'm just an economist. I can't tell you that's wrong, but I do want you to know that that's costing you the difference between $40 an hour and $15 an hour. That's costing you $25 an hour. Staying in this business, if you know, if these are the facts, staying in this business costs you $25 an hour. So $25 an hour net opportunity costs of your current situation. And wouldn't you think people would want to be aware of that? Absolutely, right? Absolutely. So some some of you might say, yeah, I would sell the business. I never wanted to be a hairstylist to begin with, right? And I'd, I'd happily go take a $40 an hour job. Others of you might say, well, yeah, maybe I really want to be a hairstylist and maybe I'll strive to grow my business so that I, so I make much more than $15 an hour. Okay. Either way, that's fine. You just want to be aware of these opportunity costs because these are uh, things that people often overlook. So homework again, we'll have similar scenarios. I want you to think through, in some cases we're doing some very simple arithmetic just like this, and then answer the questions. You'll type your answers in to the text boxes, save the file with your name, upload it back into Canvas where you found it. And I'm looking forward to seeing how you do. We're wrapping up unit one here, applying the concept of opportunity costs. See you next time.